And we are live. Okay, thank you. A few more than uh, I'm admitting now. All set? Yes, you're live. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our right now. interested parties meet and greet, um, the IF and W committee. And uh, quickly, I will go around and introduce, uh, have the committee members introduce themselves, and I'll do it right in the order that I happen to see them. So, Representative Ordway. Morning, I'm Representative Lester Ordway. I represent part of the town of Standish. Representative Lyford. Uh, good morning, uh, District 129, which is Clifton, Eddington, Holden, North Brewer, and Vesey. Representative Mason. Good morning, Representative Rick Mason from District 56, Lisbon. Uh, let's see, who else do I have next? Representative Kathy Netto. Hi, Kathy Netto, representing District 78, which is Winslow and a small portion of Benton. And I'm excited to see the snow today. <laughs> Senator Curry. Good morning, Chip Curry, and I represent Senate District 11, which includes the uh, 26 communities of Waldo County. Representative Terrio. Good morning, uh, Tim Terrio. I represent District 79, which is Albion, most of Benton, China, and Unity Plantation. Representative Landry. Good morning, Scott Landry. I represent District 113, the beautiful towns of Farmington and New Sharon. Senator Black. Good morning, Senator Black, representing uh, Senate District 17, which is all of Franklin County and the towns in Kennebec County of Belgrade, Mount Vernon, Vianna, and Fayette. And except for myself yet, had, did I miss anybody from our committee? I guess not. And I'm Senator Jim Dill. I represent uh, District Number 5, Northern Penobscot County. And again, welcome everybody. Um, <clears throat> we are going to have our meet and greet, and uh, if you have questions from uh, the committee, please use the raise hand function if you uh, can have found it. Um, that's going to be the easiest way. Uh, that function will probably be under reactions, or it may be listed right down, like on my screen, there's a down in the lower land, right hand corner of the participant list. If you click on participants, there's a little thing there that says, uh, says raise hand, a little box. And if you use those, I'll hopefully be able to see them. If you use under the reactions where it says hand clap, there's a little gold hand that comes up, but it only stays up for about five seconds, then it goes away and I, I, I may miss it, but uh, we'll see how everything goes. We're gonna go in order of the way you signed up. We have a list, I think there's about 17 or 18 folks on it. And we'll give you a few minutes to uh, present uh, about uh, your organization. And I'll read the first three. I don't know if you have the list. My first person on here is Maine Aquaculture Association um, with Sebastian Bell, followed by Maine Woodland Owners, Tom Doak, and Maine Sport and Camp Association, Wade Kelly. So if there are no other comments or questions from the committee, We'll start with Sebastian Bell. Good morning and thank you very much, Senator Dill and uh, Representative Landry and members of the committee. I'm gonna share my screen quickly here. I will not take much of your time. I don't come before your committee all that often and many of my colleagues do. So I will try uh, to be relatively quick here. Um, but there are a few things um, that I come before the committee uh, around. Oops, there we go. Um, so uh, just a quick word about our association. The Maine Aquaculture Association represents all the aquatic farmers in the state. Uh, we were founded in 1977. We are the oldest aquaculture association in the country. Um, and uh, we do a number of things. These are really the areas that we work in uh, the most. You'll, you'll probably hear from us around um, environmental stewardship and uh, water quality issues. Um, and we are known in particular for the development of best management practices and farmer training around sustainable farming practices. Um, 
something that a lot of people don't know is that Maine has been doing aquaculture for over 100 years. And on the left hand side, you see the picture of actually um, a cod hatchery that was built in the late 1800s uh, down in Booth Bay Harbor. That is now the uh, research lab for the Department of Marine Resources. And on the right hand side, those sketchy gentlemen are collecting broodstock uh, for the Atlantic Salmon Restoration Program in the early uh, 1900s. So the two areas that we have been doing aquaculture in the state of Maine have both been linked to either restoration or enhancement uh, for the longest period of time, either um, marine species like cod or freshwater species like uh, salmon and trout. We represent the commercial growers in the state and um, we do represent growers that grow both in saltwater and in freshwater. In saltwater, we grow both shellfish, finfish and sea vegetables. In total, uh, both freshwater and saltwater, we, we represent uh, growers that grow 24 different species. There are roughly 190 farms in the state and um, the farms that are in marine water lease uh, acres from the state. The farms that are in freshwater typically operated on, on private property, but they do withdraw water uh, in some instances from uh, public water uh, sources. We currently generate on an annual basis about 80 to $100 million in farm gate value. That is the point of first sale. And um, then if you, uh, typically the multiplier that's used by the economist at UMaine is about 1.8. So you can take that $100 million and it turns itself into about $180 million in economic activity in the state. We employ 700 people uh, year round. That is excluding the employees of the state and federal hatcheries. Um, the state and federal uh, governments both have very significant hatchery programs and they do put economic activity into the, the state. They do employ people and um, they are a significant um, economic impact, particularly in local communities. We have grown um, slowly but steadily over the last 20 years. And you will hear in this year's legislature um, probably some controversy around our growth in our sector. Uh, and so I thought it might be helpful to just kind of um, state the facts here. We've, we've grown by roughly 450, 500 acres in the last 20 years. That's about the size of an average size potato farm in Aroostook County. Uh, so we've added one or two potato farms in the last 20 years. So the growth has been steady um, and it's been good for the areas in which we've grown but it has not been explosive as uh, you may hear from some folks uh, around the lobby this year. The other interesting thing I think you'll hear is you may hear some concern about quote unquote industrial aquaculture. And the assertion is that um, big companies are coming in and buying up small companies. And frankly, that just isn't uh, true. Every one of our farms with the exception of two are family owned farms. Um, there has been some consolidation in the sector over the years where a family has acquired a, a, another farm to uh, increase their individual family holdings. Um, but we have uh, currently only two farms that are held by uh, investors as opposed to by uh, families. And that includes our salmon farm, for example, the Cook family has been operating in Maine for 20 years. It's uh, two brothers and a father. Um, and they are our largest farming company in the state. Uh, they have three freshwater, sorry, two freshwater hatcheries and uh, about 25 marine uh, farms. On the freshwater side of the house, we do uh, operate in the freshwater world and this is the place where I may uh, interact with your committee. We grow bait fish, trout and salmon in freshwater facilities. Um, and uh, our freshwater sector is relatively small compared to our marine sector. Um, but it is spread out across uh, the state and it does have a significant economic impact, particularly some of our bait fish growers uh, are very important for the winter ice fishing uh, sector. And, and that's one of the ways that we may come before your committee. I, I have not seen any of the bills that would suggest that we will be before your committee this year, but, um, but uh, just in case we, uh, it comes up, um, that will be probably the group that we would be uh, representing at that time, either the bait fish growers or the trout growers. And I will stop there and thank you very much for your time and um, appreciate your willingness to listen to me. I'm glad to answer any questions if you have. Them. Thanks, Sebastian. Uh, are there any questions for Sebastian? Uh, I do have one quick one, Sebastian. I've heard some inter interest or some individuals talking about the possibility of starting to grow some tilapia in the state of Maine. Is there any push on that, you know, or? 
There is a, uh, you know, first of all, it's a, it's a species which um, is def- difficult to get a permit to, to grow. Um, second of all, from a commercial perspective, main conditions are pretty tough to be competitive because it's a warm water species. And so you would have to heat water. There are small um, um, places where tilapia is grown either as part of a school science program or right. in conjunction with a hydroponic uh, vegetable production. And we do have a number of those around the state and their tilapia production is relatively small and very tightly controlled by IFNW through a permitting process. Okay. Great, thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, before I move on to Tom Doak, I would just uh, remit remind everybody that, you know, we're all kind of new with this. Uh, so there's going to be glitches uh, and some problems. And so kind of bear with us. And I noticed too, that uh, representative Danny Martin just joined us. So Danny, if you would be so kind as to introduce yourself. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, folks. Uh, Danny Martin. I am the state representative. I represent House District uh, 150 located in Northern Rooster County. Uh, I've served on this committee for a couple of years now and uh, former commissioner of IFNW. Great to see you all and uh, thank you for uh, uh, doing this for us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you, Representative Martin. Next is Maine Woodland owners, Tom Doak. Thank you, Senator. Um, Senator Dill, Representative Landry, members of the committee. I'm Tom Doak. I'm the executive director of the Maine Woodland owners and I am not as technical technologically advanced as Sebastian, so I won't be trying to share my screen with you because I would probably knock you all off the network. Um, we're a nonprofit organization. We've been around for 46 years. Our, our mission is to help family woodland owners in Maine, those people that own a few acres of woodland up to several hundred acres. Uh, those people own about a third of the woodland in Maine, and there's 86,000 people, individuals that own 10 acres or more. So it's a big it's a big number. Um, we have a 20 page newsletter, which hopefully some of you are getting and you'll all will eventually get. This was uh, our January one, which uh, represent Mason actually, it talks about a parcel of land in Lisbon that we uh, now own. So um, happy to talk to you about that. We also, own, we also run a land trust program. We're not a land trust, but we created a land trust program because we had, a, we had landowners that wanted to continue their management, have their management continued on their land, but didn't want to, didn't want to give it to a more traditional land trust because they were concerned that it wouldn't be managed. So we created a land trust where we only take lands that can be managed. Um, and now we own about 8,000 acres in 39 towns. Um, and they parcels range from 35 acres to several hundred. All the land is open for the public to use, including hunting. They're actively managed. We have ATV trails and snowmobile trails on them and we pay local property taxes. We pay about $40,000 a year in local property taxes. So um, I'm here before this committee more often than any other committee. And you would think it would be the Agriculture Conservation and Forestry Committee, but it's this committee. And there's two reasons for that. Well, wildlife is owned by the state, but it resides largely on private land. And the areas of outdoor recreation activities that this committee has jurisdiction on a lot of occur on private land. So you, you have a connection between wildlife, um, outdoor recreation users and private landowners that works well most of the time, but sometimes there are challenges. Um, I, there are some positives. There's a couple things that I think you should know about landowners in general. Um, uh, I have never met a landowner that doesn't care about wildlife uh, in some form or another. And most of them will tell you that right at near the top of their list as well. So that's an important that's an important advantage I think in trying to manage wildlife in the state that landowners care about wildlife, and the majority of them still allow public access. And I think that's something this committee has dealt with a lot and will continue to deal with it. I'm sure more in this coming session. Um, I just want to mention access a minute because it's a unique situation in Maine. Maine's private 90% privately owned. The vast majority of outdoor recreation activities occur on private land. The outdoor economy is essentially built on free access to private land. Um, that's a very kind of unique situation and it's a very delicate balance. It's rarely a benefit to a landowner to allow public access, but most landowners, I say, as I've said, do that. Um, in most places in this country, you pay a lot of money for access to land. It's often exclusive rights uh, that are sold by the landowner. 
Okay, the landowner right. makes more money on access than they do on trees. Yeah, That's you. not the case in Maine. And it's something that we should probably celebrate and continue, frankly. There's a couple warning signs I just wanna bring up. Uh, we asked uh, family woodland owners, uh, do you plan to restrict public access? And 42% uh, said no, which is a good number, but 29% said maybe, and 29% or 28% uh, said yes. You take the maybes and the, and the yeses together and you're talking about a majority. And the issue there really is um, misuse by the public of their land. Um, the department has done a fantastic job in the last few years and this committee and the legislature last year funded landowner relations uh, investment in a general fund. And frankly, that's paying off. And I, I gotta give the department a great deal of credit because dealing with this landowner relations issue is, is big. We saw it in the um, in this this spring and summer. We had unbelievable use of private land. We had a lot of public land shut down during COVID. People went onto private land, and the department did a did a fantastic job of dealing with the problems that arose for, on private land. I give them a lot of credit. Just a couple of key issues for you to think about. Forty, I mentioned about one third of the woodland in Maine is owned by these family owners. Uh, Forty percent of them are sixty five years and old or, or older. There's a lot of land changing hands right now and over the next decade or two. And I don't, the next generation of owners is gonna very, probably have a different point of view uh, about how and the tolerance of some of the things that have occurred in the past on their land. So something to think about long-term for access to, to private land. Um, I mentioned the land relations program. It's pretty critical and the department's doing a great job. Sunday hunting, uh, it's the third rail. Uh, for landowners. There's an accommodation that may have started as a blue law a year, you know, 100 years ago, but it is the third rail for landowners. It's the accommodation between hunters and landowners that have developed over time about you don't have to get permission. In most of the country, you have to get permission. Here, you do not. A uh, landowner has, has the responsibility to tell you if they don't want you. It's an odd, odd situation, but that accommodation has existed a long time. But if you change the Sunday hunting laws in this state, you will change the relationship between landowners and hunters. That's very clear to us. We support hunting, but we do not support Sunday hunting. Uh, two more quick things. Uh, current use taxation, I, this isn't your purview, but it's pretty critical. Current use taxation of land is critical to keeping land intact and, uh, and habitat intact. And that's really important. And there'll be a lot of, there's always discussions about current use taxation changes. and. Um, those laws that, that tax land as current use are critical to keeping land affordable for landowners. And the last thing I'll mention is um, um, most states have uh, landowner assistance programs for landowners and, and giving them wild advice on wildlife management. And this, I think that the department is open to that and is talking about that and actually taking some steps toward that. Uh, I think particularly on cr uh, species of critical interest or need um, they have a willing audience of landowners that might just need a little technical help on how to manage for wildlife, but they will do it with some help. And I encourage the department and they've been great in uh, looking at this issue and uh, looking forward to working with them on that and how to help landowners manage wildlife in ways that are good for all. So with that, Senator, I'll stop and happy to take questions and thank you for this opportunity. Thanks, Tom. Any questions for Tom? Being none. Senator Dill, I had one, but I keep hitting my reactions, but it doesn't seem to come up for you. Okay. Um, Representative Dill, uh, uh, so, I'm sorry, Representative Mason. Yeah, I'll get to him, but Representative Leifen, go ahead. Uh, Tom, does USDA also assist in landowners in some of uh, the activities? Well, um, Representative, there's, uh, there's, there's been a lot, there's a lot of assistance on the force management side. Um, through USDA, U.S. Forest Service, Maine Forest Service, you know, they, there's been a lot of traditional outreach for on the forest management side, but not specifically on kind of wildlife habitat, wildlife, you know, and they, they are connected for certain, but I think there's a real opportunity and great expertise in the department to help landowners, again, who are willing to, to manage their land for, to benefit wildlife with a little bit of assistance. So, and also helping the foresters better understand wildlife management so they can advise their clients. So I think there's a real opportunity here 
And I think the department is open to that. And I don't want to speak for them, but certainly they've been, they've been, they have, they are great to work with, frankly. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Mason. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Tom, where, uh, where in Lisbon do you, have you acquired land? It's, um, it's on the, it's on the Androscoggin. Uh, it's some part of the WAG property. Are you familiar with that? The WAG road? Yeah. Uh, yeah. About 145 acres. Okay. Uh, including pretty substantial frontage on the Androscoggin. I'll, I'll send you, uh, I'll send you some information. Okay. Please, please there's do. An a, there's an important ATV trail, right? On, on snowmobile yep. trail on that property. And that we, yep. you know, just so you know, we are, we will we're, we'll work with the clubs and continue that use. Yeah. And that land is open for the public to, to use and hunt and walk and everything. Yeah. So, yeah. Very good. Thank you. Protect, yeah. Are there other questions? Uh, Senator Dill, one more, if I can add one more thing. Uh, I was just ticking off, uh, uh, we have at least at least five members of the committee, maybe uh, have, uh, we have land at least five of the committee members' districts. So I'll, I'll send that information off to the members of where we have land so that they'll see it. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I see that uh, Representative Alley has uh, joined us. Representative Alley, could you introduce yourself? You have to unmute yourself. How's that? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes, sir. I'm uh, a resident of, of Beals Island uh, down in Washington County. And I, when I was elected, I had 12 communities that worked with me. And uh, I'm a graduate of University of Maine, Chires. I uh, got my administrative degree in Orono and law degree in, in uh, Thomas College. And I've been here for six years, going on my fourth term. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, before we move on to um, a couple other things I, I need to mention. One of the things as uh, chairs, we've been given the, uh, the dubious task, I guess, of policing background. And you can imagine with as many people that could be on a Zoom call, um, there can be various backgrounds. So there may be an occasion when I would ask someone to reposition your camera um, so that we can't see the background. You know, if you've got a big, um, you know, three by four picture of uh, Senator Black hanging behind you, I might ask you to uh, reposition your, your camera so that we're not all looking at that uh, particular poster. Um, but we may have to do that, and if you can't reposition, I may have to uh, shut the camera off. But I'll let you continue to speak, but uh, I, this is kind of the uh, 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 test run of us before we start our public hearings next week to, to see how things are going to go. But I just wanted to say that to everybody. As, as I say, I, I, I don't really want to be the background police, but uh, we're, we're going to have to try to, to be able to do that. Um, next, I just see that Representative uh, Hepler joined us, if she would be so kind to introduce herself. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Allison Hepler. I represent House District 53, which includes the towns of Georgetown, Arousic, Phippsburg, Woolwich, which is where I live, Dresden, and a small part of Richmond. And um, thank you for, I'm sorry I'm joining late. Wednesdays are going to be a tricky for me because I, I just started my 28th January teaching at University of Maine at Farmington. So. Great. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, and thank you. And just another reminder, we're, we're going to be in and out. We have testimonies to give in other committees. Some people may actually have two committee meetings on the same day. So you may see some of us just like in a regular committee. We're going to kind of jump in and out of, uh, of the committee meeting. So with that, our next speaker is going to be the main sporting good camp. Uh, Maine Sporting Camp Association with Wade Kelly. The next three up is the Nature Conservancy, Maine Forest Products Council, and the NRA ILA. So with that, Mr. Kelly, Wade Kelly. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, Senator Neal, Representative Landry, members of the committee. Uh, my name is uh, Wade Kelly. I'm the Vice President of the Maine Sporting Camp Association. Uh, I also own, uh, along with my wife, Tyler Kelly's camps up here in Allegash, Maine. Uh, the Sporting Camp Association with, uh, you know, we have many, many years of combined uh, 
experience bringing people safely to uh, the main outdoors, you know, to, to enjoy the great outdoors of Maine. Uh, so I'm, I'm here to, uh, today to, to extend our willingness to help, uh, you know, uh, if and when needed, uh, to ensure that the Maine sporting camp tradition remains viable well into the future. Uh, uh, we believe that those years of experience that we have, uh, combined years, uh, knowledge, you know, garnered from, uh, from living and working in Maine's outdoor industry. Um, uh, you, you know, bringing thousands of people to, to the Maine woods, uh, camps, and really instilling in them the, the love of the Maine outdoors that we have, and, and it is the reason that we are camp owners and do what we do. Uh, and it gives us a, uh, an insight into the industry that uh, we believe would be valuable uh, to you when deciding issues affecting Maine's outdoor traditions. Uh, along with that, it's, uh, this year for us, you know, uh, for the camp associations, like COVID has uh, sparked a resurgence of that back to the woods, uh, living, utilizing what the wild gives us, you know. Uh, uh, along with that, it'll, it'll, it'll uh, you know, uh, it'll have me a change in regulations and stuff that we will, will need to see, I, I would imagine. And, uh, that that uh, demand, the, the extra demand, will uh, will uh, I'm sure put into place some new regulations and everything on on the outdoor experience. So uh, we just want to say that we you know that we are here and uh, we have a lot of experience uh, and uh, would like to help uh, when we can. And uh, we also would like to say that, you know we trust in our. Uh, and our main biologists to uh, you know, uh, keep the full spectrum of the wildlife in, uh, uh, in Maine at a healthy and sustainable levels. You know, uh, I'm not as polished a speaker, obviously. <laughs> I have more glitches than the computer does, but uh, that's about, that's what we're about. And uh, so I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to introduce the Maine Sporting Camps. And uh, that would be, I'm taking questions from there. Great, thank you. Are there any questions? Not seeing any. Um, next is the Nature Conservancy, uh, Caitlin Bernard. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, Senator Dill, Representative Landry, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. My name is Caitlin Bernard, and I'm the Natural Resources Policy Advisor for the Nature Conservancy here in Maine. I really appreciate the opportunity to introduce myself and our organization to your committee and really look forward to working together in the 130th. The Nature Conservancy is a nonprofit organization dedicated to conserving the lands and waters on which all life depends. We're guided by science and we work hard to create innovative on the ground solutions for our world's toughest challenges so that people and nature can thrive together. Here in Maine, the Nature Conservancy has been leading conservation work for more than 60 years. We're the 12th largest landowner in the state of Maine, owning and managing roughly 300,000 acres. We also work across the state to restore rivers and streams, partner with fishermen in the Gulf of Maine to rebuild ground fish populations and develop innovative solutions to address our changing climate. Now for the good stuff, uh, here's what we're, we're prioritizing for this legislative session. Um, our number one priority is passing a robust bond package, including fresh funding for the Land for Maine's Future program. We're also looking at continuing bond investments in our transportation infrastructure. And we do a lot of work on upgrading municipal culverts at stream crossings. So we anticipate you know, advocating for that. We think it's gonna be in the transportation bond, but it's a big issue for us. Um, our other, one of our other priorities is advancing the work of the Maine Climate Council by translating that climate action plan into tangible policy and supporting advancement of renewable energy, which is not something that I think this committee will take up in depth, but our big focus is good citing criteria. So making sure that natural resources and renewable development can be balanced in an, an appropriate way. I anticipate TNC will work with this committee on some of these issues and others, including wildlife research and management, landowner relations and recreation issues. 
Um, thanks for the opportunity to introduce myself and our work. I'm more than happy to answer any questions now or into the future. And um, it's worth noting later on the agenda, James Cody is, is speaking. We're working with him also this session. So we're, we're, we've got a good team working on these issues this year. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions? Representative Danny Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Katie, uh, I'm fortunate this year to be a House Chair of Transportation Committee. Could you send me some information regarding your particular items yep. that you believe might be in the transportation bond? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, are there any other questions? All right, next is the Maine Forest Products Council, Patrick Strout. Well, thank you, Senator Dill and Representative Landry and members of the IFNW committee. My name is Pat Strout. Um, I live in Exeter, Maine, where there are no deer, so please don't send any more hunters our way, but uh, uh, up around Dexter area. And I represent uh, the Maine Forest Products Council my background is I'm um, a UMaine graduate with a bachelor's degree in forestry and a MS in uh, silviculture forestry. Um, and I married a forestry graduate. Um, so that's where we live in Exeter, Maine. The council is, we have over 300 member companies. Uh, we try and represent from stump to, to uh, water. Um, we have uh, loggers, truckers, foresters, wildlife biologists uh, are part of our organization. We get involved uh, representing manufacturing. So I have the state's pulp mills, saw mills, oriented strand board mills, energy plants that use wood. They're a part of uh, our group. And um, also we represent about eight and a half million acres of dues paying uh, members that's scattered throughout the state. Uh, but the majority of it is in the, in the unorganized territory. Um, and so we've got a, a large membership of commercial forest landowners in that region. Um, we, we work well with I and IFNW, uh, the department on a number of issues. We are really, if you think about it in the habitat management business, we, we uh, deal with um, kind of a shifting mosaic of habitat on our lands and that has uh, interesting opportunities for wildlife management. We'll be involved in discussions about the Endangered Species Act. We're big proponents of uh, cooperative conservation and we've uh, We've had some great projects with uh, uh, lots of colleagues on Canada Lynx, uh, the fisheries uh, improvement network we're a part of um, and dealing with issues like uh, long-eared bat. Um, so cooperative conservation is really a, a great tool in our minds. We've been involved with uh, the Climate Council. I, the governor appointed me as uh, one of the members of the council and now be uh, shifting over to the ENR committee to, to do a presentation to them uh, later on. And uh, of course, we get really involved with recreation. Uh, we share our lands. We have this open access policy. If uh, we charge a small fee, if you go through the North Main gate, Main Woods gates, but that's just for everybody's benefit so we can keep track of everybody. Um, but get involved with a lot of issues. ATVs are always a interesting opportunity and challenge for the uh, landowner community. So we'll be involved in those kind of discussions. We have uh, within our council an active uh, wildlife committee. It's the wildlife biologists from the various companies that contribute to that group. So they're a source of information for me and for you folks too, if you have questions that uh, that I can answer. I can. I have a, a ready group of people from the landowner point of view that can answer some of those questions. And we have a policy committee that meets every Friday morning to review the bills and uh, 
come up with positions and research them. So that's a really active membership. You'll hear from members um, when we get into issues that are important to us. So we love to provide tours. Um, we like to show people um, what we do. Uh, so keep that in mind as you develop different issues. We're glad to coordinate uh, visits into the forest, um, share info and answer any questions you have. And um, I have uh, a couple of folks that work with me. Michelle McLean is one of my um, lobbyists and Bill Ferdinand from Eaton Peabody. So you, you, I don't know how you see him. Well, it's, it's a brave new world here, but they'll be involved in um, helping me with some issues when I get tied up in different areas. Um, but mostly we just look forward to working with you. And uh, this is an important committee and we'll be interfacing with you quite a bit. So look forward to uh, moving through the session with you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Pat. Are there any questions from anyone? Uh, Senator Dill? Yes. Sorry, I keep, keep hitting it, but it doesn't seem to come up. Um, I'm looking right at your name, too, and it's not coming up, so. There it is, real quick. Got it? Uh, Pat, could you comment on Sunday hunting? <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, we've been pretty unified with uh, with um, the woodlot owners. We know um, we have a, a, a large landowner community, and um, but it's been a, over the years as the issues come up, we think it's kind of dangerous to separate landowner types. And we've been pretty strong about uh, maintaining that kind of policy throughout the state. We, we don't think it's asking too much to, to uh, provide access to our lands. Um, six days a week. And um, we just want to preserve that tradition on the seventh day. So that's kind of where we've been standing over the, I've been here. Uh, I think this is my 18th year with the council and it's been a pretty consistent position. So glad to talk about it and, and, and have discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, the next one up is uh, NRA with Lauren LePage. And the next three after that is the Maine Professional Guides Association, Don Kleiner, Maine Lakes, Susan Gallo, and Maine Dairy Industry Association, Agricultural Council of Maine, Julie Marie Pick. So with that, Lauren. Good morning, can you all hear me? Okay. Yep. Um, Senator Dale, Representative Landry, and members of the committee, um, it's a pleasure to be here today. My name is Lauren LePage, and I'm the state director for the National Rifle Association. Um, I handle four states, including Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Connecticut, but having been born and raised in Maine and currently living in Maine, uh, this state's very near and dear to me. Um, as many of you know, NRA focuses on issues related to the Second Amendment, firearms, and hunting policy. The organization's been around for, for a little bit. It was formed in 1871. Um, and as we all recognize, hunting and shooting sports are an integral part of Maine's outdoor heritage. And I'm committed to working with you to protect these traditions in Maine. Uh, NRA has worked tirelessly to develop robust hunter safety training. We're well-versed in advanced training for young hunters, the latest research and tactics for hunting success and public works that benefit hunters nationwide. Um, we're proud to offer all kinds of resources for youth hunters, hunter safety, and women's programs. And I'm really just here to say, please feel free to reach out and uh, use, use us as a resource as you engage in committee work this session. Um, I did, you all will be receiving a letter from me that just includes my contact information for your reference. Should you have a question, comment, concern? just want to reach out um, this year. So that's really, that's all. Thank you for the opportunity to in introduce myself this morning and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for Lauren? Seeing none, we will move on. Next in the agenda is the Maine Professional Guides Association. Good morning, uh, Senator. Yep. Yep. Go ahead. Representative Landry, 
uh, distinguished members of the committee. I'm Don Kleiner. I represent the Maine Professional Guides Association, an organization of about a thousand small independent businesses. Um, we're the folks that provide outdoor recreation to people from away for the most part. Uh, the last year, as you might imagine, has been a real challenge for everybody. Uh, many of our members lost a couple of, or three months of their season. Some lost their entire season because they were closed for that period. It's certainly been a challenge. And we did benefit from that little blip of everybody wanting to get outside and go with a guide. Um, but it has not been uniform across the industry, that's for sure. Uh, one of the things I would like to call out the department for is their promotion of guides and guiding, and along with the main office of tourism. I think that's been a real positive aspect that's gone forward. Uh, one of the things I see on the horizon that we all need to be cognizant of is many of our members promote their services at out-of-state shows, which are effectively canceled this winter. And of course, we're all trying to figure out how to do it. We're all learning a new way to do business. Um, but that is, I think, uh, concerning at this point in terms of how will folks generate the customers they need to keep their businesses afloat for the coming year. Um, where possible, the association works with other organizations. It's pretty common for us to come in with uh, Tom Doak or Pat Strauch. We are members of the Natural Resource Network. Um, and you're hearing actually from a variety of our membership today. I wanna just mention, or I, I think to echo what Wade Kelly said, and that is the resource is the base of our business. Um, I've been proud over the years and I've been in front of this committee off and on since 1993 in a variety of capacities. So yes, I'm old, I admit it. Um, but the resource comes first, and that's the most important thing, and very often the bottom line in any of our conversations. And I want to stop and thank you for taking an important part in the most successful wildlife management model in the world, um, the North American Conservation Model. If you haven't done any reading on it, you should. It's an important commitment and way that we do business that's been very successful. There are, though, some conflicts inherent in that system. And I'll just kind of sketch it out real quickly. I think you've already heard from the landowner side, and that is that the wildlife is owned by the people of the state, whereas it lives on someone's land. And in the European model, which our forebearers came from, the landowner also owned the wildlife. So it's a distinct difference. Um, and it, it does create that kind of automatic conflict that in Maine, we've been very lucky to work through and I think have made significant progress in the last four or five years on landowner relations and how that works. Um, I think that's kind of it about the association. Just for you to know, I'm a working guide. My company, Maine Outdoors, has been in business for 35 years. Uh, I do fishing trips on fresh and salt water. I offer short canoe trips and upland bird hunting in the fall over trained dogs. Uh, and to give you kind of some perspective on the industry, I'm a small one person business, but my company issues roughly $1,000 worth of one day fishing licenses each year. Many of my peers sell more than $20,000 of department licenses to their clients annually. Um, in addition, I serve on the Land for Maine's Future Board, and currently I'm on the Landowner Sports and Relation Advisory Board at the Department of Inland Fisheries, Fisheries and Wildlife. Yeah, I used to be able to talk, and I'd be happy to discuss either of those as well if you have any questions. I think that's it. I've caused enough trouble for one day. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, committee members. Thanks, Don. Uh, the questions? Seeing none, we will move on. Next is Maine Lakes, Susan Gallo. Everybody. Morning. Hi, hello, uh, Chair Dill, Chair Landry, and members of the IFNW committee. 
thanks for the opportunity for introductions today. I really appreciate it in this virtual world. I thought it was something that might go by the wayside. So thank you for sticking with this tradition. I won't take much of your time today, but I did want to introduce myself and my organization today to the committee briefly. My name is Susan Gallo. I'm the executive director of Maine Lakes. We're a statewide nonprofit organization, membership organization. We have about 2,500 members and supporters, which includes uh, direct individual members and members of our uh, more than 80 lake associations across the state. So we have great connections to people living on and using lakes every day. Uh, we were formerly the Maine Lakes Society. We changed our name and logo last year, but our mission is the same. Uh, to protect, promote, protect, and enhance lake water quality uh, and to preserve the ecological, economic, recreational, and aesthetic benefits of Maine's lakes for residents, for visitors, and for wildlife. So we maintain a limited presence in, uh, the, during the legislative session. We're just a small organization with three staff people, but we do work closely with uh, multiple partners across the state, including about a dozen water, other watershed organizations uh, who we work with on advocacy when we need um, grassroots activism and we need calls to legislators. So we feel like we have a pretty far reach for a small organization. We, our primary interest is in policies and practices that relate directly to the protection of Maine's lakes and the maintenance of water quality. And for this session, we'll be watching lots of different proposals, um, but we're interested in things relating to this committee, invasive species, invasive plants, native fish, shoreland habitat, and in this session in particular, boating and boating safety. I know there's an important boater safety bill coming. And uh, we're very interested in a lot of in any of those things, but particularly boat safety this session. We run, just so if you don't know our organization, we're easy to find. We have a new website, lakes.me. We'd like to be a resource for the committee if there's anything on lakes and water quality, uh, lakes.me. If it doesn't have your answer, we can find answers for you. We have connections, you know, you, you should all know about the Lakes of Maine website, lakesofmaine.org, that's maintained by our uh, collaborators over at Lake Stewards of Maine, but um, a great resource and database for lake information. So we'd like to be offer that to the committee. Our programs that we work on mainly are landowner, uh, Lake Smart is our flagship program that works with landowners to uh, increase uh, shoreline management to reduce erosion and protect water quality. We're reissuing a lake book uh, shortly that uh, is a great handbook of lake uh, protective, you know, sort of actions you can do, what you need to know about lakes and how to protect them. That'll be issued. Uh, the new uh, addition will be issued uh, within the next couple of months. We hope that to get that across the state to our members, and I think it would be a great resource for committee members if you're interested. I'll I'll make sure you get a um, get a copy, and then we uh, also have a conference every June, which this year will be a series of Wednesday webinars uh, starting next week uh, at three uh, four o'clock. And we have a great, a wide array of topics, a lot of them related to uh, lake science, the sort of the science of protecting lake quality. So please check out that, um, that menu of speakers that are from all across Maine. And we also have some national speakers speaking on wake boats. There's been a big wake boat study uh, in the Midwest that I think will um, trickle down to this committee eventually in terms of there's a lot of interest in managing wakes and the concerns about wake boats for erosion and property values. So again, consider us a resource and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much for the opportunity for the introduction. Thank you. Are there any questions? Seeing none. I will move on to the next one, which is uh, Julie Marie Bickford, the Maine Dairy Association and Agriculture Council of Maine. The next three after that is James Cody, and then the New England chapter of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, John Simono, and the Humane Society with Katie Hansberry. Oof. So Julie Marie. 
Okay, thank you, Senator Dill, Representative Landry, and distinguished members of the Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Committee. I am Julie Marie Bickford, the Executive Director of the Maine Dairy Industry Association, we're known as MDIA, and we represent all of the dairy farm families that are providing over 70 million gallons of fresh quality milk each year, most of which is bottled for drinking by one of our four major fluid bottling plants. We also support a vibrant artisan cheese sector and proudly back some of Maine's premier ice cream and gelato makers. Dairy has been described as the cornerstone of Maine agriculture, meaning that dairy is the intersection between both animal and crop agriculture. And we are key supporters of the agribusinesses that are critical to sustaining all of the different agricultural crops that are found throughout Maine. Uh, dairy is also an important part of the tapestry of private landowners who provide access for important outdoor activities, hunting, fishing, snowmobiling, ATV riding, hiking, cross-country skiing, you know the litany better than I do. Um, in embracing the role of stewards of our natural resources, the 700,000 acres of land that Maine dairy farms manage in both cropland, some wooded land and some wetlands, um, our farmers make that available for public access because we support the, the you know, our number one industry, tourism. Um, I will echo what Tom Doak said about Sunday hunting being that, that critical accommodation. Um, land, main landowners do not charge for access. We don't want to charge for access, but knowing that we have one day a week where our farm families don't have to worry if there is someone else out on their land, it, it's an important piece of um, what keeps this relationship going. Um, Maine dairy farms also, we're all farm families. We are a key part of the rural economic engine that keeps the state going. Um, the, the money that comes in, you know, main dairy farms are employers, our taxpayers, um, we're buying goods and services and putting all that money as most everybody else does as a small business back into our economy and very invested in our communities. And um, that relationship, we, we look as a partner with the state of Maine and in tackling a lot of the challenges that are before you, both in this committee and others, um, we look to interact and try to come up with creative solutions. Having said that, one of the big issues that we are having to face, um, especially in the last year that you've probably heard about, is the emergence of PFAS and PFOA chemicals um, being found on various sectors of farmland uh, throughout the state. They have been found initially on dairy land, but the this is not a dairy issue. Um, it is an issue of great concern because our farmers rely on the health of our lands to feed the health of our animals. Um, we know that, that we also interact, you know, wildlife comes on our land. And so it's all one big package. Um, the reason some of these chemicals are being found is because Maine farmers were following the best science of the time in terms of managing spreading of, of nutrient sludge um, on land base. That was the best science. And so um, I bring this up primarily to encourage you as these issues come before you and intersect before you, I would hope that you would be mindful that in this scenario, the farms are as much a, um, a victim or facing the unintended consequences of having these chemicals as 
the people of, of Maine in, in general or private wells. This, this is something that we are struggling to make sure that we can continue make a living because healthy food, safe food is our top priority. Um, but it, this will be an extreme challenge and we are one of the first places in the country to deal with these types of issues. And so, um, you know, we'd, we'd hope that you would be as supportive of our farmers' uh, challenge of trying to reconfigure and, and um, restore their lands as we are of other sectors that are um, and other impacts of these chemicals. Okay, I also serve as the president of the Agricultural Council of Maine, AGCOM, which is an organization made up of various organizations that represent the various sectors of agriculture. Um, and, and you have several of them who are presenting Maine Aquaculture, Maine Farm Bureau. Um, there, there are lots of them, uh, Wild Blueberry Commission, Fruits and Vegetables. We are kind of a clearinghouse for discussions on issues that impact agriculture. And we want to be a resource for you. If you have questions or issues that come up that impact the agricultural sector, um, you can bring them to AgCom and we can help gather the resources for you and give you the, the broader context. So I hope you will feel free to use us as that resource. And with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Are there any questions for Julie Marie? Seeing none, thank you, Julie Marie. Thank you. And we'll move on to James Cody. Good morning, Senator Dill, uh, Representative Landry, and members of the committee. It's uh, great to see everyone, and unfortunately, we have to do it virtually, but look forward to seeing you all in person again sometime, uh, hopefully in the near future. Uh, I am James Cody from Farmington, Maine, and come before this committee on a fairly regular basis um, uh, in a few different capacities, but just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the interests that I work for so that you know I, I can be a resource wherever helpful. Uh, I, I, I will say this morning I, I was thinking about trying to uh, make the Zoom work from an ice shack out on Clearwater Lake, but I decided I, I just sit in my office here this morning. Um, I represent the Maine Trappers Association as one of my clients. Uh, the Maine Trappers is about a thousand member organization. Um, and we work on various rule changes and law changes uh, with the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife and this committee. We're involved in species planning processes and really with a goal of creating opportunities uh, to e expand opportunity for trappers and at the same time make sure that we are protecting uh, the species uh, that we all enjoy. Um, I, I also, as many of you know, work for Bernstein Shore and uh, am a lobbyist on behalf of uh, many, many organizations and clients through the firm. Um, you'll see me on some energy issues on occasion as well as uh, other fish and wildlife and natural resource issues. Uh, as Caitlin Bernard mentioned, I do represent the Nature Conservancy and specifically on issues like Land for Maine's Future and the Bond, which I'm, I'm hoping you'll all consider and, and support this session. Um, so you'll see me and, and hear from me in that capacity as well. Um, and then just two other points that I thought I would make. I, I was also uh, appointed as a commissioner of the Maine Indian Tribal State Commission. And as some of you may know, uh, the commission has jurisdiction over fish and wildlife issues on some lands where tribal lands and state land uh, meet and interface. 
So I, I know as tribal uh, issues uh, will, will be debated this session, if I can ever be helpful there, I'm more than happy to. Um, and lastly, I just thought I would mention um, that in early January, I did take the position of uh, Executive Deputy Director of the Maine Professional Guides Association. Um, Don Kleiner will play point on all things legislative and policy, uh, but if I can ever be helpful in uh, helping to connect with him or, or making anything work or finding information, I'd be happy to do so. Um, but again, Don Kleiner will, will play point on those issues. Um, beyond that, I, I really look forward to working with everyone and I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Next is the New England chapter of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, John Simono. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Senator Dill and Representative Landry and members of the committee. Um, you may not be familiar with Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. Um, we are a relatively new uh, organization in Maine. Uh, we've had a New England chapter for some years, um, but we've re recently grown our presence here in Maine. Um, this is kind of our first time that we've participated in uh, the meetings in this format. We've submitted comments on bills in the past, um, but one of the advantages of this platform is it allows volunteers like myself to step away from my day job for a few minutes and uh, join you. Uh, I have a short presentation. Uh, let's see. Bring that up for sharing. Um, backcountry hunters and anglers. Oh, no. Oh, come on, advance. Hang on a second. Sorry about this. Get my slideshow present. Technology. Let's see if this is going to work. All right, sorry about that. Uh, the mission of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers is to ensure North Americans' outdoor heritage of hunting and fishing in the natural world through education, work on behalf of wild public lands and waters. Uh, demographically, uh, BHA represents chap is represented by chapters in 45 states. Uh, there are three Canadian provinces and three uh, territories. We have about 40,000 members across North America, um, and we have 200 members in uh, Maine as part of the New England chapter. Uh, we're a relatively younger organization with 68% of our members, 45 and younger. Um, as a nod to uh, our folks that have uh, mentioned a large amount of public land, uh, the limited public land there in the state of Maine, uh, we want to note that backcountry is a state of mind, whether you're miles back or in a tree stand on your family's back 40. BHA defines backcountry as a simple guideline, as a place to find solace and derive a deeper connection with the natural world. The focus areas for BHA are access and opportunities, public lands and waters, and fair chase. We recognize in Maine that our access is uh, generally allowed upon by private landowners. So our uh, patterns of ownership in Maine are not consistent with a lot of our national policies, but we do appreciate the, the opportunities we have to have access on private land and look forward to working with uh, folks like Mr. Doak and Mr. Stouch on uh, access issues on private land as well. Um, we work on defending public water access, advocating for the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Uh, here in Maine, it would also be the Land for Maine Futures Bond. Um, and we are also working to enhance access to existing public lands. Uh, the lack of access is often cited by sportsmen and women as the leading reason why they leave the traditions of hunting and angling. Public lands and water, uh, we would be working on habitat conservation, conserving priority landscapes, responsible off-highway vehicle use and management, and defending our public lands legacy. We have the obligation to fish, wildlife, and their habitats to build partnerships with the state, federal, and tribal management agencies to ensure decisions are guided by current peer-reviewed science. In the area of fair chase, uh, we're upholding and promoting ethical values. 
In the early 1900s, Theodore Roosevelt helped pioneer the standards of ethical hunting. Overall, we must assure that the ethical pursuit of fish and game is upheld as dearly as our own obligation and morality as citizens. Uh, in Maine, we've done quite a bit of programming and actually have collaborated with the department um, for several R3 events. Uh, over Rang Pond, we brought wild game and we're a bit known for uh, having wild game served at our events. Um, we also uh, helped with the new hunter program over at Swan Island, uh, where some of our membership demonstrated blinds, tree stands. Uh, we have a member who is a, a very talented butcher, so he uh, demonstrated some uh, more advanced butchering techniques for wild game. Uh, we run our own mentoring program uh, where we try to pair members who are experienced with new members uh, who are just starting to take up hunting and fishing. Um, we do work service trips. Um, in the fall, we did a what we call a public land pack out, which is a promotion uh, that we do encouraging our members to visit public land and load up their backpacks, their tackle box, their boats, whatever they're using to get on public land and carry out trash that they might find. Uh, we had a small group go into the Highlands Public Reserve Unit and uh, backpack out uh, trash that was left over from a marijuana grow site, actually of buckets and fencing and uh, other materials that uh, a member had identified during a turkey hunting trip. Um, currently, we're doing a lot of virtual events. Um, many of those are educational based, uh, partnering with agencies um, and members with experience, uh, whether it is about scouting, uh, gear needed, uh, skills, uh, anything we can do to share and promote uh, hunting and fishing. Um, we have also done some film events last uh, year before the COVID hit. Uh, we held a event called Public Grouse uh, in Portland, which documented uh, different species of grouse in the United States that could be hunted uh, on public land. Um, and it showed uh, members of BHA and uh, uh, other upland hunting uh, organizations. Um, we built our organization, our membership, uh, based on Pint Nights. And at Pint Nights is our opportunity to share stories about our, our activities. Uh, and also discuss conservation issues, um, often bringing turkey calls to breweries and other places like that and uh, making a little bit of a scene and, and having a good conversation. Uh, we really miss those events and, and hope soon we can do those again. Uh, we have been doing some archery uh, 3D shoots and clay shooting uh, activities. Uh, in the fall, we have a promotion for Hike to Hunt. And last fall, we actually did a collaborative event with the Trust for Public Lands, uh, the uh, Highlands, uh, gosh, I don't want to say the name of the but associated with the Shiloh Pond purchase, actually, uh, where we had a hike to hunt event followed by a live broadcast uh, podcast with the gentleman from Big Woods Bucks team. Um, so we look forward to uh, collaborating with this committee. Uh, we've had a long relationship working with the department in recent years. Um, our website is backcountryhunters.org slash New England. Uh, that'll bring you to the page, landing page for our, our, our chapter. Uh, where there'll be events, uh, news articles, um, links to bios for our chapter board. Uh, the email directly to the main state le leadership team is maine at backcountryhunters.org. Uh, we have two chapter board members here in Maine, Rob Bryan of Harpswell and myself, John Simono from Durham. And that's all I'll take and let's do some questions. Are there any questions for John? Seeing none, thank you. Next is uh, Humane Society with Katie Hansberry, followed by Sportsman's Alliance of Maine, Maine Farm Bureau Association, and Maine Audubon. Thank you, Senator Dill. Good morning, everyone, Representative Landry and members of the Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Committee. Thank you so much for the opportunity to say hello this morning and introduce myself and my organization. It's really nice to see some different faces on my Zoom meeting today, uh, rather than some of the more usual meetings I've been in over the many months this year. And um, I am the main state director for the Humane Society of the United States, and I've been in this role for almost nine years now. We are a nonprofit organization and were founded in 1954. Now, while the Humane Society of the United States provides direct care services to over 100,000 animals every year through our sanctuary work and response to natural disasters such as wildfires out west, 
Um, also large scale cruelty cases, such as the Great Dane case in nearby New Hampshire, the focus of our work is to drive change through policy, um, working with stakeholders on all sides of an issue, um, doing what we can to try and find common ground and drive change so that we can create a more humane society. I work with advocates all across the state on local, state, and federal levels on policy matters. Um, I also work with a number of other animal welfare organizations across the state. I'm currently on the board of directors of both the Maine Federation of Humane Societies and the New England Federation of Humane Societies. Um, and I also work frequently with our state agencies. Uh, with respect to the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, I recently served on the steering committee for um, wildlife rehabilitation, where we were reviewing and updating the policies and rules uh, regarding wildlife rehabilitators here in the state of Maine. And I'm also currently serving on the steering committee for the fur bearer management planning process, along with some of the other folks um, that are introducing themselves uh, to you today. Um, and also I'm currently a member of the state's rabies working group, although that think that is technically under the umbrella of the um, Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry Department, but um, IFNW, IFNW has representation on that as well and plays an important role in those discussions. As for some key wildlife issues that we work on, um, we work to address uh, the serious issue of private ownership of wild and exotic species, um, ending wildlife killing contests, protecting native carnivores. And we also have a wildlife land trust that includes a number of properties here in the state of Maine and uh, a number of other issues. So you'll see me from time to time during this, um, this legislative session. And I just wanna thank you again for this opportunity. Um, I'm looking forward to working with you on your committee uh, matters. And I also wanna be a resource for you. I know um, all of you represent a large number of constituents and you hear from them on all sorts of issues. So if anyone reaches out to you with respect to an animal welfare matter um, and you need some help getting them their answers or their issues addressed, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. And if I'm not able to help you, um, hopefully I would be able to put you in touch with someone who can. So thank you again for the time this morning and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Katie. Are there any questions for Katie? Not seeing any. Uh, thank you again. And we'll move on to Sportsman's Alliance of Maine. I'm not sure I saw Dave Trahan on here. Is there someone from Sportsman's Alliance of Maine? No, they have not uh, signed on, Senator. Okay, thank you. We'll come back to them if, uh, that, uh, if they show up. Next is Maine Farm Bureau Association. Thank you, Senator Dill. Good morning, um, Senator Dill, Representative Landry, and members of the committee. My name is Julianne Smith. I'm the Executive Director of the Maine Farm Bureau Association. I have served in this role since 2017 when my son and I moved back to Maine from Colorado. Um, and um, I've certainly enjoyed every minute of being back home. I grew up in Monmouth on a dairy farm, and we currently reside in Reedfield. And I am very happy to be representing all of the farmers in Maine through our Farm Bureau Association. We're a nonprofit organization. We have a voluntary membership. So we only have members that want to be part of our organization and we are completely farmer run. Um, we essentially are the voice that says, this is what farmers want. Our, um, Farmer members meet every week to discuss mm -hmm. bills that have been published and take positions on those bills. Um, for those of you that are interested, we do send out a weekly newsletter that says where we, we take positions on bills. We don't wanna inundate you with emails so I don't automatically add you, but if you'd like to know what our positions are, I certainly can do that. Um, most importantly with your committee, I come before you generally regarding hunting issues and um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, one of the biggest threats to crop production is wildlife. And we have had a very fortunate and positive relationship with the department in helping to control crop loss um, and mitigate wildlife damage to our crop production. You have an excellent department, um, an excellent warden service. Um, Commissioner Camuso should 
certainly receive lots of accolades for the leadership that she provides and everyone in the department because every single time one of my farmers has called me distraught and said, I have lost acres and acres of this crop. Um, the department has been incredibly responsive and helpful and tried to find ways uh, to help those farmers. So we're certainly glad, glad to have the opportunity to work with uh, the department on a positive way. Um, and we are also, um, we do have one of our members who serves on the Landowner Relations Board and are very, very um, proud to be serving there and happy that that exists because it certainly helps with many of the issues that do arise. Uh, we, for the last uh, 50 years or so, have opposed Sunday hunting. Um, we certainly love our land. We love sharing our land, um, but we would ask for one day a week where it's only our land. Um, and that is something that is of grave concern to our farmers this, this uh, session and every session. Um, and um, I think that that is um, one of our, our biggest worries that, that that would change and we would have to then post our land. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions, but essentially I, I'm here on as the voice of the farmers and um, are very, very happy to uh, answer anything that you may need to know. Thanks, Julianne. Are there any questions? Seeing none. Again, thank you. I have two left that have signed up, and that's Maine Audubon and Wild Blueberry Commission. So I'll start with Maine Audubon and Eliza Donahue. Thanks, Chair Dell, Chair Landry, members of the committee. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to introduce myself um, and the organization I represent and to not talk about Sunday hunting. Um, my, uh, my name is Eliza Donahue. Um, I have a cold. Uh, I represent Maine Audubon, uh, where I'm the director of advocacy and staff attorney. Uh, so Maine Audubon is a wildlife conservation nonprofit. Um, we're based here in Maine. Uh, we fulfill our mission to conserve Maine's wildlife um, and habitat by engaging folks of, of all ages in nature through a science-based approach to education, conservation, and the work I do, advocacy. You know, some of the examples of the work we do are um, providing hands-on experiential nature programs um, from, you know, preschoolers to adults. Uh, we serve about um, 8,000 students a year. Uh, we promote um, public awareness of lake ecology issues through our annual statewide loon count, um, along with a lot of other citizen science projects. Um, we work uh, closely with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and, and IFNW on uh, monitoring and managing breeding habitat for the endangered uh, piping plover and, and least terns. Um, those are shorebirds. And we uh, do advocacy work primarily um, at the state level, though I do do a fair amount of um, federal work as well. Um, we're proud to be the state's oldest um, and largest in wildlife uh, conservation organization. Um, we trace our roots back to the late 1800s with the Portland Society of Natural History. Um, we've got eight wildlife sanctuaries, um, you know, from as far north as Elliottsville Plantation, um, all the way down to Cape Elizabeth. We serve about uh, 10,000 members, um, have about 30 folks on staff, uh, lots of volunteers, and serve probably about 50,000 folks annually. I have a, you know, pretty regular presence um, during the legislative session. Uh, used to spend a lot of time uh, in Augusta, not so much these days. Uh, in addition to uh, being in front of this committee, we, we and by we, it means me, um, are often before the Ag Committee, um, Energy Utilities Technology Committee, um, Environment Committee. You know, we're really committed to our science-based approach to conserving wildlife and habitat. Um, I'm part of a team that includes uh, biologists, wildlife ecologists, and the positions that we take on bills and the things that we contribute to um, conversations before the legislature are, are really based in their expertise um, in their respective fields. 
you know, I anticipate um, being in front of this committee um, only a, a bit um, for this coming session. Uh, we plan to engage on uh, the bill having to do with lead ammunition, um, bills that touch on Maine's Endangered Species Act, um, perhaps some bills um, pertaining to the impact of watercraft on wildlife. So just a handful of stuff, you know, outside of this committee, um, work a lot on land conservation funding, um, on renewable energy siting, um, doing a lot of work related to offshore wind right now. Um, also thinking a lot about land use planning generally, um, thinking about how, uh, you know, human development um, can, uh, can coexist with wildlife and, and give uh, wildlife what they need uh, to thrive um, in Maine, particularly in, in the light of our, our changing climate. Uh, you know, that's, that's kind of what's up with Maine Audubon. Um, maybe a little bit about myself. I've been doing uh, conservation work, uh, conservation advocacy uh, professionally in Maine for maybe about eight years. Um, I'm from here originally. Um, I live in Brunswick now with my, um, with my husband and, and toddler daughter. Um, I practice law in Maine. Um, I'm, I'm licensed to practice here. Uh, I have a degrees in forestry uh, and really love this work. Um, you know, I'm really proud to be, um, to have been raised in a family that uh, where, you know, we spent our family vacations uh, canoeing the many, you know, rivers of Maine and, um, and hiking. Um, you know, my, my dad and brother are both uh, registered guides and I'm really interested, though I perhaps am not, uh, don't work on these issues a ton uh, before these committee, this committee. Uh, it's a lot of stuff that I'm very personally interested in. So you guys do great work. Um, I really encourage you all to reach out um, if you have any questions. Uh, I'm an open book. I'm gonna put in the chat my uh, email address and my cell phone number. Um, so uh, please be in touch, don't be a stranger. And I'm, I'm really impressed you guys have got this Zoom stuff um, down. So way to go. Thank you. Thank you, are there questions? All right, seeing none, my last signed up individual is the Wild Blueberry Commission with Eric Venturini. So Eric, it's all yours. Good morning, Senator Dill. Good morning, Representative Landry and members of the Committee on Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. My name is Eric Venturini and I'm the Executive Director of the Wild Blueberry Commission of Maine. The Wild Blueberry Commission is formed by state statute and we are made up of five grower representatives and five processor representatives. And the commission is dedicated to conserving and promoting the wild blueberry industry in the state of Maine. And our work towards those goals are, can be broken down really into four major priorities. Improve the economic viability of Maine wild blueberry production, conserve and preserve Maine wild blueberry land and its human and environmental systems, support University of Maine research and extension, and identify and respond to opportunities and threats. Based on the, uh, excuse me, based on the most recent USDA census, uh, the wild blueberry industry in Maine is made up of about 485 farmers harvesting wild blueberries on about 38,000 acres across the state. But that is a small proportion of the total acreage owned and managed by wild blueberry farmers in Maine. Production is statewide, but it's concentrated in some of our most rural and impoverished counties, Washington and Hancock County. Overall, through direct and indirect contributions, our industry brings about $250 million of economic activity to the state every year. Our farmers are an economic engine for the state, but they're also an iconic piece of Maine's heritage and of Maine's future. This crop has grown unlike any other crop. Maine's wild blueberries are truly wild. They're never planted. They just exist here. They're truly a natural resource and are managed by hundreds of Maine's small farmers, family farmers to proliferate and grow a small healthy berry that we promote and market across the world, the Maine wild blueberry. Like so many others on this call, I'm a graduate, both undergrad and masters from the University of Maine. Uh, 
I did my graduate work there studying wild blueberries. Uh, before I took this role, I worked with the USDA as a biologist, as part of a nonprofit conservation organization that worked with farmers. And part of what drew me to this job is that wild blueberries are one of the most sustainably grown and harvested crops that there are. It takes very few inputs to grow a wild blueberry. And yet you can find this product, Maine wild blueberries on grocery store shelves across the country, across the world. I won't get into specific issues uh, on this introductory call, but I just wanna to mention to you all that this has been a hard year uh, for everyone. And for wild blueberries, it's been no exception. Not only did we deal with COVID-19 and the challenges there, but we're hit hard by uh, frost and drought uh, and, and had saw decrease yields across the industry by about 50%. So many of our farmers are struggling. Some of them are closed. Some of their businesses are, are shutting their doors. I only ask that as you look and consider it legislation this year, uh, that you consider any and all potential impacts on Maine's farmers, Maine's wild blueberry farmers, and Maine's wild blueberry businesses. Because we just want to make sure that when everything does return back to normal, we still have a healthy agricultural economy here in Maine. Like several others introducing themselves today, the Wild Blueberry Commission is also a member of AgCon, the Agricultural Council of Maine, the Natural Resource Network, the Maine Farm Bureau, the Board of Agriculture. We also do, do work with Kim Cook, and so you may see her representing the wild blueberry industry from time to time. Thank you, Senator Dill and Representative Landry, and thank you, committee members. I'll take any questions. Thanks, Eric. Are there any questions for Eric? Seeing none, again, thank you. Um, I didn't see Dave Trahan um, log in. Is there anybody from Sam? I don't see anyone. So uh, is there anyone that I missed or uh, didn't have a chance to sign up that wishes to say anything? Okay. A um, couple of committee businesses left. Uh, first is uh, tomorrow uh, we have our meeting with on the supplemental budget uh, with AFA. And so if anybody would like um, to volunteer to do that, I have an ACF committee meeting at the same time. So I'm tied up. So if any of the committee members would like to volunteer to represent IFMW committee at the uh, AFA meeting, please let me know. And you can just email me or whatever, and we'll figure it out. Um, I think that's about it. When we adjourn, which I'm going to ask for a, a motion to adjourn here in a second, would would Peter Lyford and Linda Lacroix stay on a little bit afterwards? I got a couple quick questions. Sure. Well, and with that, I have a, I can have a motion to adjourn. I want to thank everybody that uh, has spoken today. Is there a motion to adjourn? Robert Allen has got his hand up. Representative Alley has made the motion and Tim Terrio, Representative Terrio has seconded it. All in favor, just raise your hand. Thank you all. And we will see you next week. So please, Peter and Linda, hang on for a minute as everybody